Thank you, Todd. And thank you all for um, coming today. I know you're, you're really wondering and we'll get to it. I wanna start with acknowledgements. I've been very lucky to work with a number of very talented folks. The lab presently is um, an undergrad researcher, Rebecca, lab manager, Jeannie, and two grad students, Sanjay and Ran. And I've had a number of um, other postdocs, graduate students, undergraduates, um, interns, student workers through the years. I'd also like to acknowledge some other people, um, Donna and her lab for some of the seed resources that I've used, Leo and um, Bob and Hui Hua for some um, hormone measurements, Glenn Collins and Randy for help getting soybean transformation going in my lab, um, Lynette, Bruce and Art for a whole ton of things, Arnie and Na for statistical help, Donna Wall over at the micro, microarray facility for um, processing microarrays for us, Ling for a ton of stuff, and also uh, as inviting me to be a co-editor on a book that we worked on. All the rest of you, uh, Esther, Dan, Michael, Luke, Lou, and Larry, the past and current administration for ABT. I've been fortunate to have funding from a number of um, sources, NSF, USDA, United Soybean Board, Kentucky Science and Engineering Foundation, and a number of sources from UK. So this is my average DOE since my last promotion. 80% research, 14% instruction, 6% administration. I wanted to touch just briefly on instruction and administration before I um, focus most of my talk on the research. So I've been involved in a number of formal courses. This uh, includes PLS 622, Plant Physiology 1, each fall semester, um, pretty much since I got here. Seed Biology, which is PLS 657, and last time we offered it, we offered it at 500 level to attract some upper level undergraduates. That's spring of odd years. I teach about half of this, about a third of this course. ABT 201, this is a one credit, um, mostly seminar series course uh, to introduce our students to different research programs. Um, in biotech, hopefully help them find a lab home for their research projects. So I always think, oh, it's this one credit, you know, kind of seminar base, it's, wow, it's an easy course, until I remember, it is part of the graduation communication and composition requirement, so there are a lot of draft and final papers to read. So it is a quite a bit of work that way. It's part of the GCCR because uh, the other part of the GCCR for our students is ABT 301. Um, I have parentheses around that, I don't have a formal appointment with that course, but um, because they do a lot of practice presentations and final presentations, the course is capped at 12 to 14 students per section um, to allow time for all those activities. Last spring, when uh, Bruce Downey was teaching the only section of the course, we had 22 wanting to take the course. So he was agreeable to doing the introductory lectures and then we split the class. I took half and worked with them for their writing and their oral presentations. Um, I've had five PhD students graduated, two are current, four prior postdocs, one incoming postdoc. Um, all of the people who have left my lab are still in science, either academics or industry, with the exception of one person who's facing the two body problem. San Jose is great for her husband in computer science, not so good for plant biology. Uh, I, they've all been to um, national or international conferences and published their work of the people graduated. Um, I've had a number of undergrad researchers in my lab, a variety of different um, forms. Some are student hourlies. I've had a couple of interns from BCTC who were transitioning to UK. They're, they transferred to UK. One has graduated now. Um, number of ABT 395 projects. Some students who just wanted to get their hands dirty in the lab and get some experience as freshmen. So a variety of situations in that case. Of those students, seven have graduated, five went on to grad school or have finished grad school now. Um, one I lost track of, so I'm not sure what she's doing, and um, one just finished. Five are still in the program. Many outreach activities through to different levels, from fourth grade through the general public. A lot of these activities have been with Bruce and Lynette, some with my husband, and believe me, he makes me work way harder, okay? I don't get any slack because of the relationship. Some with Esther for some of the recruitment activities and some on my own. 
since um, 2009 to just very recently, I was 10% administration because I was serving as co-director of undergrad studies for ag biotech, now ag and medical biotech. I uh, shared those duties with Michael Gooden, and that involved a lot of things. Not everything is here. Um, so at times I had upward of 64 advisees. I don't anymore because Esther is now our full-time academic coordinator for ADT, something that came out of the last review. So she might have 64 advisees, but um, I don't anymore. But at times, earlier on, I, I had quite a heavy advising load. And a lot of meetings with prospective students and families, you know, often in the fall, a couple a week, recruitment, meetings to um, find out information important to our students and disseminate that. For example, the new MCAT that has a section on sociology and psychology and how do we train our students to be successful at that, that MCAT assessment um, and lots of letters of reference, two submissions for scholarships that would have provided 10 to 12 um, students with $10,000 per year scholarships and enrichment activities. We weren't successful yet, but the groundwork's now been laid for that to be attempted again in the future. There's always adjustments to things changing. Um, some other exciting things, and I'm not taking credit for this, but there's a university scholars program for ABT um, to get their BS and to get their master's degree in medical science in five years. Bob Houts and Joe Springer took the lead on that. I've been more involved working with Mark for something similar for ABT, BS, and, and MS, IPSS. Um, program review, I mentioned, a lot of th good things came out of that. One of the recommendations was considering changing the name to something that reflected what we do with our students. And so we became agricultural medical biotechnology, and that's had an impact that you'll see in a moment. More activities to pair students with labs, I'll tell you about one of those, TAs, and as importantly, Esther is full-time AC for ABT. Program's been growing, and that's diagrammed here. So in the blue is ABT 201 enrollment since 2009 to this year. Um, so again, that class that the students generally take in the fall of their second year, okay? And you can see that there's a general trend upwards. ABT 101 also, um, that class all are entering ABT freshmen take. So if you're looking at the class for 101 in 2010, that's you know, more or less who's gonna be in um, 201 in 2011. So again, upward trend and look what happened here. That's kind of scary. Um, basically doubled our incoming class, probably in response to the name change. So I'm a little bit worried <laughs> next year and we'll, we'll see. Uh, with that uh, advertisement, so one of the things that the students wanted from the last review were more activities to help them find lab homes and projects that they were interested in. So as part of that, I started having um, one of the section, one of the meeting times for ABT 201, instead of being a faculty talking about their program, to be a more informal mixer event. So this is gonna take place on November 4th, uh, sorry, 9th this year. It's a Thursday at four o'clock out in the plant science lobby. Hopefully I have to confirm that. Um, Faculty bring posters or laptops, just themselves, and just talk to groups of students casually. So if you haven't gotten an invitation from me, don't feel like, like the evil fairy godmother. Um, I've picked on people who have come before first. If you're interested in coming, please just send me an email so that I can get some information. Because I advertise to the students who's gonna be there and a little bit about the research to help them find the faculty they wanna to talk to. So just send me an email. I could spend the hour bragging about the students. The students are really what makes the program great. Um, I will limit it to this one slide just with a few examples. Uh, these students have all been in the news recently. Angela for a fellowship at Dartmouth and she was one out of five students nationwide. Um, Fabian for a fellowship um, where he spent the summer at Ames and he was one out of 29. Alana was the global Alltech young scientist of the year, so she has a full paid tuition to grad school. And um, a number of other students actually received NSF graduate research fellowships this year to help support their studies in grad school. Matt Kreit to go to um, Yale, Andrea Estes to go to UCSF, and um, Allison Young to go to Michigan State. So they're a great talented group. With that, I may turn to the research, and this information is in my materials, but my current funding is from NSF, 
And that's supporting some work to look at how AGL15 um, regulates genes um, in Arabidopsis. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the goals of that at the end. We also have some funds from Kentucky Science and Engineering Foundation, and that work is um, for soybean. And I'm not going to tell you about that today. Um, developing, I'm going to tell you about chromatin immunoprecipitation. So that's been a real interesting experience. When I came here, I was trying to work out the protocol for plants. There were a couple publications in other organisms and none in plants. Um, in fact, my first NSF grant came back as I think do not fund because they didn't believe that it was going to work. By the time I resubmitted, I had some preliminary data and was able to get a grant. But um, so that, that's that been interesting because now if you do a search for chromatin immunoprecipitation on like Web of Science, there's more than 13,000 hits and more than 500 just in the Arabidopsis. So very interesting. So um, as part of that, we actually um, sent our protocol to <laughs> I stopped counting at 80, more than 80 labs, more than 15 countries worldwide. Um, publications, one interesting thing that I learned putting this together is my average citations per publication were 46. That's up a little bit from the material in my CV. I think it was 42 now, or back then. The book chapter and book co-editorship co with Ling. And um, the other thing I was surprised about was how many panels I served on, five NSF panels, four USDA. Um, all but one since the last promotion, and there were eight other invitations that I declined because I was already serving on another panel. All right, with that, research, AGL15, which stands for agamus like 15. This is a MIK MADS domain protein that accumulates to its highest amounts during embryo development. So this is an Arabidopsis um, embryo section at heart stage of development. You can see why it's called that. Um, and I used an antibody against AGL15 to see where and um, the protein was accumulating. And you can see the color is this red gold color that you get as a signal throughout the embryo and in polka dots. So those are the nuclei. So what does it mean to be a MADS domain protein? So MADS are a group of transcription factors. To be a MADS domain protein, you need this chunk of protein that's about 55 to 60 amino acids. This domain is involved in binding to DNA and it binds to DNA in a sequence specific manner. It binds to things called card motifs which is CC, AT rich, GG. They vary a little bit in forms, but um, they are sequence specific binders. The MADS is involved in dimer formation because these things bind as homodimers and heterodimers. Um, so that's what you need to be a MADS. Now to be an MIKC MADS, which is a subtype of MADS, you have another domain called a K domain. Uh, it's called a K domain because it forms a coiled coiled structure like keratin um, that we have, right? I just means intervening linker, and C just means carboxyl terminal domain. It's involved in a number of things. Why is it called MADS? That's because the first, well, four of the first genes where this domain was recognized included MCM1 from yeast, which is involved in mating cell type specification, as well as other things. A gamma is from Arabidopsis, so um, this, transcription factor is involved in telling cells in the third world of the flower to form stamens and the fourth world to form a carpal. And I'm going to show you what happens in a moment when that doesn't work properly. D, deficiency from snapdragon is also involved in flower development, petal and stamen in this case, and serum response factor from humans is involved in um, gene expression or response to serum and growth factors. Obviously, the coolest way to arrange these letters into an acronym is MADS. So I am a mad scientist, right? Yes. Okay, so we only have a handful of MADs. We have serum response factor and we have some MEF genes that are involved in muscle development. But this family has expanded greatly in plants. There are 107 members in Arabidopsis. This is the agamus mutant. So this is what happens when the agamus gene is non-functional. So you get sepals in the first world, that's normal, petals in the second world, fine. But the third world that's supposed to give you six stamens with the pollen and the sperm instead give you six, pe six petals. The fourth world that's supposed to give you the carpal with the embryo sacs with the eggs instead gives you another flower bud which reiterates the sepal, petal, petal, sepal, petal, petal. So this flower is without gametes, so it's called agamus. The convention in Arabidopsis has been to name um, newly discovered MADS 
pox genes as agamous like and give them a number. So that's why HL15 has its name. It's only like agamous in that it has a MADS domain and a K domain, but different in other places. So HL15, I already told you that it accumulates to its highest amounts during embryogenesis, starting very early. This is an eight cell embryo. You're seeing four of the eight cells. This little structure is called a suspensor and it acts kind of like as an umbilical cord for, for the embryo. It's also from the fertilized egg. And throughout morphogenesis, basically, and you can see the nice polka dot look here in the torpedo stage embryo, it declines as the seed matures and isn't um, detectable in the mature dry seed. It is expressed in subsets of cells after completion of germination, but the highest pattern is in embryos. And basically there are um, a lot of, so I looked at a lot of different tissues, um, different zygotic embryos, apomictic embryos, so dandelion was an easy one to get, um, somatic embryos, embryos from microspores and different mutants that would extend or prematurely exit embryogenesis. And there was a correlation between um, higher level accumulation of HL15 and embryo identity. Okay, that's kind of old news, so I'm moving through this kind of fast. Um, can providing HL15 induce, enhance, or maintain embryo identity? So we did have plants that were overexpressing HL15. So to do this, you express the, your gene of interest, HL15 in our case, using a 35S promoter. That's a strong viral promoter, and it's going to cause um, relatively high levels of expression everywhere all the time. So now instead of having the high levels just in embryo, it's in other tissues. And there are a number of phenotypes. So you can see the wild type plant here. Uh, you can see the overexpressor looks a little bit different. The pedials are shorter, the leaves are rounder, they're greener, which doesn't show on this, this bad photograph. But um, these guys flower late compared to the wild type. And when they flower, for wild type, the floral organs, the sepals, petals, and stamens fall off shortly after fertilization, and you're left with this naked fruit called a salic that has the seeds. For the overexpressors, the um, perianth organs stay attached and beautiful all the way down, and here's the close-up. So I was dissecting out the developing embryos from these salics and putting them into culture, and what I found is that within three weeks, secondary embryos would pop out of that X plant, and the frequency with which this happened correlated with the accumulation of HL15. And that's shown here. So here's a picture of what it looks like. This um, cultured embryo started popping out some stuff that kind of turned yellow and then another green cluster. So basically, um, in the WAS ecotype of Arabidopsis, for wild type embryos, about 20% would produce this tissue. For the overexpressors, about double that amount. And then for um, a loss of function, about half really. In the Columbia ecotype, we saw something a little different. The wild type were way more efficient, so the overexpressors were not significantly different, but the loss of function showed a reduction. Okay, well you could then subculture these little embryo foci um, about every three weeks or so, and there we saw a difference in both ecotypes. And that was that the overexpressors would keep going and going and going. Basically the wild type um, WS or Columbia would eventually stop and die, same with the loss of function, but the overexpressors would keep going. So this is a picture of what it looks like. This is one of the times when I realized I've been here for a while, although these oldest cultures were started before I came um, here and I brought them with me. They're now 20 years old, so it was kind of a moment for me. Uh, DUS kind of colliding with research when I realized that I had cultures that were older than the incoming freshmen. Okay, so uh, the oldest cultures, which really we don't do experiments with, we're just kind of sentimentally attached, will celebrate their 21st birthday on November 4th this year. This is another system I'll tell you about briefly. Um, this was a paper in genetics where they showed that certain mutants in Arabidopsis that had extra big pseudopical meristems could produce somatic embryos from these meristems when the seeds were allowed to complete germination in a liquid media that contain 2,4-D. This is a synthetic auxin, and it is um, probably the most common thing that you see to induce somatic embryos. This is what they look like. This, um, the hypocotyl and the cotyledons are kind of callous, and then you get this beautiful green embryo tissue at the shoot apex. 
we were interested because one of the few places that I could actually see AGL-15 accumulation after germination was in the young shoot apical meristem, and you can see it in the young leaf too. This is four days, by six days you couldn't see this anymore, so it's, it's shut down pretty quickly. So would AGL-15 accumulation have an effect in this system? And the answer is yes. So for Columbia, um, basically 20 to 40 percent. So this, this is a synthesis of about two years of data, two years of experiments. Basically 20 to 40 percent would produce this tissue. And you can see an example here. There's the cotyledons and the hypocotyl, and you can see the embryos there at the uh, bare stem. For the overexpressors, about double the amount, 40 to 60, depending on the experiment and more prolific per seedling. So you can see all those little embryos popping out. And then there was a reduction in the loss of function, in this case combined with a redundant gene called AGL18. It's AGL15's closest relative. I'm not gonna really talk about this, but a, a question you might have is, can you transfer this to other plants? And yes, Chow Lin, who is a postdoc, did some work in soybean um, and found that um, Overexpression of the soybean ortholog of HL15 called GMHL15 promoted somatic embryogenesis in that plant. So, control compared to two overexpressor um, lines, you can see faster development of the embryos really. And then, what you do in this system is you subculture the, the nice um, green embryos onto a media that has less auxin, about ha half the auxin, and they proliferate. And you can see the wild type proliferates, but it dies off too, whereas the overexpressors stay green and more beautiful. Since then, um, a group in China, the Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, has reported that um, orthologs of AGL15 in cotton can also promote somatic embryogenesis in cotton when overexpressed. And there have been a couple more other papers that um, show a correlation between potential orthologs and somatic embryogenesis in some other species. So why do we care? Um, so Science Magazine, for their 125th anniversary, featured 125 questions of what we don't know. They called it, what we don't know. What don't we know, sorry. 25 of them made it into the hard copy of the magazine. The rest were just online. But the one plant-related one that made it into the hard copy was, how does a single somatic cell become a whole plant? Even though this was 2005, we still really don't know how, how do single cells de-differentiate and re-differentiate to do a plant embryo. It's important because um, somatic embryogenesis is one means of um, regeneration for transgenic plants, whether you're trying to create transgenics for applied um, purposes, drought resistance or insect resistance, or um, you're testing gene function, basic science. Often you are trying to manipulate gene expression and see what the effect is on the plant. So you need to have transgenics for that as well. A lot of plants don't do this very well. So if we can understand um, how AGL15 is promoting this, maybe we can tweak things to make it better, make it work a little more efficiently and make it easier to obtain transgenics. Okay, so this is the recipe for how to make a hairball or determining gene networks. So we know HL15 is bound to DNA in a sequence-specific manner, and it's presumably regulating gene expression. So we kind of need two pieces of data. We need to know where it's binding um, on the DNA, genome-wide, and we can do this by using chromatin immunoprecipitation. And we need to know what effect that binding has on um, the linked gene. So we need to do some trans transcriptomics. So for example, we need to compare the HL15 overexpressor to control. Something that's expressed would have more transcript from this gene in the overexpressor compared to the um, control plant. We could also compare uh, HL15 loss of function, and again, we use the double mutant because of redundancy to control. So something that's expressed would have a decreased amount of RNA transcript from this gene in the loss of function compared to control. Conversely, a repressed gene would have decreased RNA in the overexpressor compared to control and increase in the loss of function compared to control. So these changes in the transcriptome could be the result of direct regulation by HL15 or they could be indirect farther down in the pathway. So we need to combine these two pieces of data to find genes that are bound by HL15 and responsive. 
So these might be direct expressed genes. They might be direct repressed genes. Um, those who show changes but don't show binding are um, farther down in the pathway and are indirect target genes. So I already told you a little bit about CHIP, so um, just to cartoon it for you. So you need your transcription factor in the nucleus bound to its in vivo sites, okay? You kind of glue everything together by treating the tissue with formaldehyde. Formaldehyde will cause very short range crosslinks between the DNA and the protein. It'll also crosslink proteins to proteins. You isolate the nuclei, break them open, chop the DNA to pieces. We want the pieces of DNA with the pink on it. That's age L15 in my cartoon. We don't care about the blue or the red, just the pink. So you add an antibody against your um, transcription factor of interest. You then add um, a reagent you can purchase, which consists of large, heavy beads that have um, something called protein A covalently attached, or sometimes protein G, depending on your antibody. But those are proteins that will bind to the constant part of your antibody. So now we have big heavy bead with protein A bound to our antibody, bound to our antigen, cross-linked to our, our DNA. So it's very easy now to separate what we want from what we don't want and wash it, elute the DNA, and get that back. Another thing that's been interesting, so um, the way that you look at the chip population, once you isolate it, when I started the lab, we were cloning them and sequencing one, them one by one. And I thought, well, we'll sequence 100, and when we see repeats of something, that, that will be a real target versus something that's not repeated that would be nonspecific. Well, we did 100, and we had one duplicate, I think. And I, I started getting worried. Um, it turns out transcription factors bind thousands of places, so that shouldn't probably have been, if, if I had known that, it wouldn't have been a surprise at the time. It was kind of a surprise. But anyway, we used to sequence one by one. Things changed. Um, we tried a custom chip about that time, which was working about that time. Whole genome tiling arrays became um, available. <coughs> I'm gonna explain what this is a little bit in a moment because I'm gonna show you some of this data later. And now the way to do it really is next generation sequencing. So we're back to sequencing, but just everything instead of one by one. I wanna tell you a little bit about the tiling array because I'm gonna show you some of these um, traces later. So this is what it looks like. This is from Math and Matrix. And this tiling array has 3.2 million features on it. By features, um, I mean at different spots basically that each have a 25 mer oligonucleotide that represents part of the genome. So for example, on this chromosome, we have this part represented by oligo one in this spot, this part by oligo two and so forth, okay? So here's our binding site. Our chip population, because we sonicate the DNA, is gonna be randomly um, cleaved really. So if we take this chip population and we use it to hybridize on this probe, some parts will have relatively low signal, only one piece binding. Some will have two and so forth. Where the peak is, where the binding site is, you'll have the most and et cetera. And so what the program that we use does is it looks at one of the features. It looks three to the left and three to the right and it averages that. Then it moves down one and does the same thing. And it generates this kind of plot where you can see the amount of binding. Does that make sense to people? This is actually what part of the chip looks like, all these little sparkles. And Yume was the one, she was the grad student who did the chip chip work for HL15. What she learned is that HL15 can both directly express some genes and directly repress other genes. So, um, so we had a number about a little more than 250 direct expressed genes that included LEC2, FUS3, and ABI3, I bring your attention to these because these are important transcription factors during embryo development. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those guys. Also direct repression of genes, uh, about 150 um, directly repressed genes. So it's a dual functional transcription factor. So as I mentioned, LEC2, FUS3, and ABI3 uh, that are direct AGL15 express targets are important in the later stages of embryogenesis to get the embryo to complete normal morphogenesis, to keep the embryo as embryo and not have it 
uh, transitioned into seedling, keeping um, germination from a, a, uh, occurring, maturation programs, etc. Okay. The all transcription factors, and at the time, this is what the model looked like. This was from another lab, To et al. Um, they knew LEC1 probably was upstream of ABI3 and FUSE3 just because it affects more phenotypes. LEC2 they thought was upstream of ABI3 and FUSE3 as well. They thought there was some cross-regulation. These are all dotted lines because they didn't know if they were direct or indirect interactions. This same year, John Harada's group um, published a paper in PNAS characterizing the genes that were expressed by LEC2. This is not a CHIP study but it was set up in a way to try to get direct targets. One of the things that they found was a direct target of LEC2 was AGL15. ABI3 and FUSCA3 were not. Okay. So then UMA's data gets added with the solid green line showing direct expression, okay, plus another um, several hundred direct expressed and direct repressed. Chris was a graduate student who did some used to hybrid to look at protein interactions. And one of the things that interacts is LOB40. You'll hear about that briefly later, but um, let you also upregulate that gene. So we went from when I started wanting just one real target of HL15 to wanting them all now, okay? And then we wanted the targets of the targets, okay? So then we turned our attention to FUSCA3. Um, Fang Fang Wang was a postdoc in the lab. We had intended to do the transcriptomics, um, but another group scooped us on that before we did that. Okay, so this was published in Yamamoto et al. Yamamoto et al. Um, and what they found, so they were comparing a fusory loss of function to wild type. So they found 785 genes that had decreased transcript in the mutant compared to wild type. So those would be genes that need FUSCA to be expressed. Those are FUSCA3 expressed genes. They found 644 that were, um, had increased FUSCA, sorry, increased transcript in FUSCA3 compared to wild type. So those are FUS3 repressed genes. So we didn't want to really repeat what they were doing. That seemed like a kind of a waste of money. We just overlaid um, Fung Fung's data on theirs. A little more than a thousand binding sites. This is also pretty typical that um, many of the sites that transcription factors bind don't show obvious changes in transcript. Um, so most of them just seem, seem to be sitting there, at least the way we're looking. But there were 220 genes that overlapped with the FUSE 3 expressed. None overlapped with the repressed. Okay? So Unlike HL15 that acts as an activator and repressor, FUSE3 is just a transcriptional activator. It actually does have regions of the protein that look like a transcriptional activation domain. So we add her stuff. It's never enough, right? So then we went after ABI3. We saved money, right? We didn't do the transcriptome for um, FUSCA3, so NSF allowed me to change the objective and use that money to map the regulatory network for ABI3. So in this case, we, we, didn't, we did do the transcript element. We saw 628 genes that had decreased transcript in the loss of function compared to wild type. So those would be ABI3 expressed. And 885 with the opposite, so the ABI3 repressed genes. Again, those are direct and indirect. We overlay the chip-chip results. And we find that there's overlap on both sides. So this is a manuscript in preparation. Um, more are direct expressed than direct repressed. However, ABI3 seems to be able to um, do both, directly express some genes, directly repress other genes. So we can add more arrows. So here's, here is the hairball, OK? And remember, there's several hundred more targets for ABI3, for FUSCA, for AGL15, for LEC2, had 700, and um, LEC1's being done by the Harada Group too. So there's a hairball, there's a cat. <laughs> I hate to say it, she inspired me this morning by actually leaving a hairball 
in my chair. <laughs> so I didn't bring it to show it to you. Anyway, um, you might be looking at that hairball and say, well, how does that help us with the somatic embryogenesis, right? So you have, and I admit it, most of what I'm showing are transcription factors because I love transcription factors. But there are other things involved. So one thing that we learned about looking at HL15 is, and, and we actually looked at work in, uh, the work in Arabidopsis that we did as well as some work in soybean. But what we found is that um, a number of genes controlled by HL15 are involved in ethylene biosynthesis and perception. So you can ask, you can say, well, would an overexpressor, and we did this work in soybean because there's bigger embryos, does having increased HL15 in soybean cause increased ethylene production? And the answer is yes. So we had two different um, cultivars, Jack and William. So we're comparing an overexpressor line in each of these to the wild type. And you can see in both cases, there's a significant increase in the amount of ethylene production. Okay, so. Can we manipulate ethylene in culture and alter um, somatic embryogenesis? We did this in Arabidopsis and soybean. So I'm gonna only focus on one part of this, but you can't really add ethylene to the cultures because it's a gas, but you can add the precursor, ACC. So we did that in both plants. And what you see here, this is a shoot apical meristem somatic embryo system. Remember counting embryos at the meristem. So again, Columbia with no addition is about 25%. I told you generally 25 to 30. This is also Columbia, but now we've added some ACC and we're up above 40%. And that's a significant difference. Also in soybean, we can add ACC to the media and see a significant impact on somatic embryo development. So we can take what we know from these gene networks and potentially tweak the culture media to make somatic embryogenesis happen more efficiently to hopefully um, recover transgenics more efficiently. I'll just remind you that in the um, soybean transformation system, this one, there are quite a number of spots where you're relying on regeneration by somatic embryogenesis. First of all, you're doing biolistic transformation of embryo tissue, somatic embryo tissue, so you need to be able to obtain that in the first place. You transform and then you put it in a media, a selective media, and you're hoping that the transformed cells are going to give you embryonic clusters. Okay, so that's another part where you need somatic embryogenesis. You're gonna let them proliferate, more embryogenesis. At some point you smash them to bits and you try to get um, those clumps to make embryos, a bunch of embryos. So there's a lot of steps. And um, Jeannie is actually doing some work now trying to test addition of things like ACC at these different steps to see the impact on um, recovery of transgenics. Brand with the KSEF money is looking uh, more clo closely at um, gene, gene networks controlled by HL15 and soybean. And that brings me to kind of a future direction and something that I'm really interested in. So Q3 directly expresses genes. Okay, boring, not really, but um, ABI3 expresses some, but represses others, AGL15 also seems to have these two functions. So how can one transcription factor both express and repress gene expression, right? So um, those of you who are into transcription factors will say, well, there must be protein-protein interactions, right? So this is work from other labs. Um, these uh, papers summarized in an online tool called BioGrid, data repository. And so what I'm showing here is ABI3, which is a B3 domain transcription factor, so I have things color-coded. And the cis element that it binds to is called an RY motif. It goes C-A-T-G-C-A, -C -A. sometimes there's a T-G, okay. Um, it interacts with a number of um, other proteins. HIF1 is a basic helix loop helix, and ABI3, and there's a couple other proteins that are B-zips, and they bind to basically CAC, GTG, with some variations. ABI4 is another kind of transcription factor called an AP2 domain transcription factor, and it binds to CAC, CG. And then ABI3 also interacts with these things called DELAs. 
the reason why it's a square is that is to remind me to tell you that they're not thought to actually bind in a sequence specific manner to DNA. They associate to protein protein interactions and they often function as repressors. So, is there any difference between the expressed and repressed in presence of these um, different cis motifs? The answer is yes. First, I'm showing you yellow for the RY cis motif, the CATGCA, that um, little sequence. So basically, of the direct express genes, which were 317, 187 have at least one of these motifs. That's 59%. So the, the program um, that I use called CisGenome will allow you to generate our, what are called matched control sets of DNA fragments. So I have 317 um, binding sites. The average size is a um, little more than 1,000. It will generate randomly from the Arabidopsis genome another data set of um, the same size and the same number. And you can see how many, how many RY motifs are in that data set. So the average of three match sets was only 39%, and that's a significant difference. For repressed genes, um, we had 87 genes, only 20 of them had an RY motif. So that's only 23%. The repressed sequences averaged um, less, about half, and so that's why the match set number is less than the expressed, okay? But that's no difference. So it's only enriched in the express. Okay, how about uh, CAC GTG, where the basic helix, helix took one and some of the other VZIPs combined. So what you find out when you look at these is um, 59 compared to 14% and 44 compared to 5%. So that motif, that binding site is enriched in both the expressed and the repressed genes. Finally, ABI4, again, only enriched in the expressed um, genes. It's mild, but it is significant, um, not in the repressed. So presence of this motif, this motif, and this motif are associated with the expressed genes, but only the G box, the CACGTG with the repressed genes. Remember, too, that we have these uh, DELAs that don't bind to DNA, and it actually turns out that PIF1 that will bind to a G-box also associates with these DELAs. So maybe there's a difference in how the complex is binding to the DNA for ABI3. What about AGL15? Um, so Chris Hill was a grad student. She did a yeast 2 hybrid screen to look at protein interactors of AGL15, and she found a number of interesting ones. Only some are shown here. Another group was interested in this protein called topless um, and topless related proteins. They're co-repressors. They're involved in a repressive complex. Um, this is a part of a histone deacetylase complex. So what happens is this associates with um, DNA specific transcription factors. It removes acetyl groups from histones. That causes the lysines to have a positive charge and bind tighter to the negative DNA. So things wrap up tighter and turn off gene expression. So this is a repressive complex. Now interestingly, Chris found that AGL15 interacted with SAP18, which is another kind of adapter protein that interacts with the deacetylase, HDA19. AGL15 could interact weakly, so the double lines mean interaction. And then this other group showed the TPL, TPR interaction with AGL15. So this could be a repressive complex. They're squares because these are things that associate with um, transcription factors bound to DNA that don't bind in sequence specific manner themselves. Chris found a number of other MADS box genes, or MADS domain proteins, I should say, that interact with AGL15. One is called Cephalata 3, and there are a number of other ones. Cephalata 3 has a nice transcriptional activation domain, and then also LOB40 that you saw on the previous slide. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about LOB40 today, but MADs bind to these card motifs. So is there a difference in the card motifs between the repressed and the expressed sets? And the answer is no. If you just look at all cards, it looks like there's no significant difference in whether they're present or not in the direct bound that leads to expression compared to the direct bound that leads to repression. 
if you start looking at different cards, there might be some differences. Part of what we're doing with the NSF money is, um, so now we want the gene networks controlled by the interactors of age alpha gene. So we're gonna add more to the hairball. Rand is looking at this repressive complex. Sanjay, who just arrived, will be looking at the um, step a lot of three. There are some interesting differences between the expressed and the repressed gene sets. And that is shown, well, part of that is shown here. So again, this is that cis genome trace from that tiling array. So this is why I kind of wanted to spend some time explaining that to you. So here's an example of a repressed gene and an example of an expressed gene. So interestingly, the repressed genes tend to be single exon genes. So this is a gene model on the bottom, and it's one exon. Okay, and these are just the untranslated regions. In fact, 40% of the direct repressed genes are single exon genes, and that's compared to only 19% of the whole genome in Arabidopsis being single exons. Conversely, on the express gene set, you can see these, these are the introns. So this gene is running this way, that's what those arrows mean. This, the start codons at this end, the stop at this. And these thin lines are the introns. And for the express gene set, only 4% are single exon. They mostly have introns. So these are both significant. This is a significant difference. The other kind of interesting thing is um, some introns can enhance gene expression by a not very well understood mechanism called intron-mediated enhancement, or IME. It's not like being an enhancer of gene expression. So a real enhancer of gene expression, you could move five prime or three prime, you could move it around and it would still function. But these sequences have to be in the transcribe region and they have to be towards the five prime end. There's an online tool called IAMeter where you can measure whether your introns are likely to enhance gene expression or not by this IME. Um, there are some characteristics of ones that can enhance expression. They tend to be at the five prime end. They tend to be bigger. You can see this one's bigger than the other ones. And they tend to have some sequence motifs in them. But basically what um, I learned was 63% of our expressed genes that have at, least one, have at least one intron, generally the first one, that can moderately or strongly enhance gene expression. That's predicted to, I should say. Um, that's compared to only 15% of Arabidopsis introns overall that can do that, or that score that way, I should say. Another difference um, that you might see here is that the um, repressed genes tend to, the majority, 69%, have just kind of like one binding site at one end of the gene. And the cutoff people use is usually two, so that's what the red line is. Whereas the majority of the expressed genes tend to have two binding sites at either end of the gene, or sometimes one in the gene and one at the other, um, one at one end of the gene and one within the gene, but distinct sites. So you could imagine a situation where um, a repressive complex, the binding part is HL15, so it's bound to one side, it's recruiting the histone deacetylase factors and repressing transcription. Possibly for an express situation, you have two binding sites at either end of the gene. So here's the transcriptional start site towards the end. We had a five prime site and a three prime site. We could have binding to two sites, and then we could have protein-protein interactions to stabilize this loop, okay? Mass domain proteins um, are known to form these kind of protein-protein interactions to control gene expression. In the last few minutes, I'll just give you a little um, bit of preliminary data that says a loop might occur. So um, FLC is a gene that encodes a repressor of flowering. FLC is itself a, encodes a MADS domain transcription factor and it represses flowering, okay? And um, they know that a loop forms between the five prime and the three prime regions of this gene, okay? That's work from Carolyn Dean's lab. FLC is one of the ways that plants know that they've gone through winter and it's spring and it's time to flower. 
So some types of Arabidopsis have to go through vernalization, which means weeks of cold treatment, not just a brief cold treatment, but longer term cold treatment. Um, during vernalization, FLC gets shut off. And then when it warms up again, it's actually stably shut off so the plants can flower. All right, so they know also that this loop gets disrupted to ver vernalization. Um, that vernalization silences FLC and now you can flower when spring comes. FLC, this has also worked with Carolyn Dean and Rick Almas in the lab, gets reset during embryogenesis, turned back on. Well, here is how HL15 binds to FLC. So here's the gene model. You can see that big first intron again. There's important re regulatory elements. But you can again see a couple sites uh, that HL15 is associated with at each end of the gene. So could HL15 be involved in mediating an interaction between these regions? Let me walk you through how this experiment works. So this is CHIP combined with 3C, which stands for chromosome confirmation capture, okay? Or sometimes it's just called chip loop. There are a lot of different flavors of, of chip now. So here is our gene, and we have a three prime, or a three prime and a five prime site. And, you know, maybe the, the introns need it or not. There might be related mechanisms, there's some evidence. So we're going to cross-link things with formaldehyde. If there's a loop stabilized by this protein-protein interaction, these proteins will be cross-linked by the formaldehyde as well as the protein DNA interactions. So this will be stabilized. If there's not a loop, then you're not gonna have that protein-protein cross-linking. So you do the cross-linking, um, you get your nuclei, you add a restriction enzyme that's going to digest the DNA in a sequence-specific manner. So it's gonna make sequence-specific cuts, okay? Same here, so dash, dash lines. Do the chip experiment um, to, uh, to get HL15 DNA and maybe other protein complexes. And then do a, what's called an intramolecular ligation. You just add an enzyme that will ligate the ends. But because things are really dilute, they have to be, the ends have to be close together. So it has to be held in this complex to get ligated. So here you'll have ligation occur. And here you won't because things are too dilute. You can then use PCR primers. Um, here it would be, you know, thousands of base pairs, but in this case, because we cut chunks, in our situation, it was going to be a 300 base pair piece that would be amplified if this loop formed. Here are where the primers would be in this situation, and you would have no PCR product. So here is the preliminary result for FLC and HL15. Um, and so you can see with primers 1F and 1R, that in the immune precipitation, we have a band and it's at 300 and the pre-immune we don't. You can see, oh, I should mention the dotted lines are where the restriction enzyme is cutting. So this one and this one are the relevant ones. Um, you can see that the digestion must be pretty good or that it's working because you don't get a product with 2F and 1R. So maybe. So that's part of what we're going to be looking at for NSF. And with that, I'll say, and um, be happy to take questions and thank you for your attention.